Good evening. We absolutely have to be able to build AI systems in Europe. That's what Wendy Hall told us. Uh, and that suggests that currently we're not. And this raises the question why and, you know, what Europe could do about that. Good evening for the fourth time. My name is Janos Stelker. I am a correspondent for Politico in Berlin and I'm covering artificial intelligence for Politico. And let's start tonight by looking at what kind of progress there is in Europe currently. And at this point, we should, you know, we want to turn to the member states, um, Europe's three largest economies, um, who are also, and I think it's fair to say, the, the continent's front runners when it comes to artificial intelligence. We're going to hear from Germany, we're going to hear from the United Kingdom, and from France. All three of those countries have released their own strategies for artificial intelligence. The documents are out there. Um, I'm sure, you know, a lot of you have had a look at them, read them, at least in parts. So the idea tonight is not to repeat what's in those documents, but, you know, we want to put some flesh to the bones. Let's think about what has already been translated into action since those strategies were published and what else is in the pipeline. And we have three panelists tonight here who, you know, can give us updates on that because each one of them was in their respective home countries involved in writing those national strategies for artificial intelligence. So I would like to invite them up on stage now, and then I will introduce them to you individually. Great music. So, Good evening. Starting all the way over there, Björn Böning is a state secretary in Germany's Federal Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. His labor ministry is one of three ministries in Germany that were overseeing um, the German AI national strategy, and it was approved in November as the last one of all three of those. Uh, Tabitha Goldstorp. She is an entrepreneur, she is the co-founder of Cognition X, and she is also the chair of the AI Council for the UK Government's Office for Artificial Intelligence, and the UK published its AI sector deal last April. And then last but not least, Bertrand Payes, who is the national coordinator for Francis, Francis Artificial Intelligence Strategy within, and now deep breath, the Interministerial Directorate for Digital and Information and Communication <laughs> Systems. Okay. Okay. Nice. <laughs> no, it is the name we changed in a few Impressive. Weeks. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I wasn't even trying in French. Um, and France published its AI strategy last March, so one year ago, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And so as we can see, you know, it's been some time uh, for all of your strategies since they were first released, which is why you know, I would like to start by taking some, you know, doing some stock taking and just, you know, looking at, you know, where, where we stand with those. Um, because, of course, you know, writing a strategy is the one thing, uh, but then translating that into action and walking the walk um, is another. And that's why I'm really curious to hear from all of those. And Bertrand, since your country was the first one to release a strategy, you'll receive the first um, question from me. So when I talk to AI experts, they essentially agree that there are three components that are important to boost an AI ecosystem. That's, you know, it's talent, um, something that Wendy Hall stressed very much earlier. It's the right infrastructure, and then it's access to data as well. Mm. Um, so because that is one simple truth about today's cutting edge artificial intelligence, um, the more data you feed it with, the better it gets. You know, there are different alternative approaches in the making, but when you look at the cutting edge machine learning of today, that's just the truth. And um, your you know, strategy makes it clear that you're not uh, deaf to that or you're not blind to that fact. Um, you write in there, one year ago, a key issue in France remains that the pool of available data in France remains underexploited. So um, what have you done so far to change that? Um, thank you very much, Hinesh. Um So this idea of data is, I think, it's one of the most complicated in the in uh, in the strategy. And and uh, Wendy all uh, 
explain how Princeton Data Trust can be can be a solution. We we do not have the same the same kind of ID, but we're trying to to find a way to to exploit data. Our first first uh, priority was on health, where we building right now a health data hub, where we will put this we will put all the yeah most of the of the health data of of the French population, and this is one of the advantage of having kept a completely public health system because we have like one of one big database with all the all the French people, and. And this is a, a, a treasury for, for AI, but it's not used for that right now. And so we, on this topic, have, have been able to, to launch this project that will come in the, in the coming months. The second part was about open data. So we had a strong legislation on open data since uh, perhaps two years ago. We have been accelerating that. And it can be useful uh, for companies. I take an example. There is a... a a, a startup that's called Shift Technology, a French startup that helps insurer to to um, against the fraud, and they're using weather data in their model so to able to check if the guy says it was raining, it was not raining. Well, it's basically, not AI, but <laughs> but they're using that in their model. And for the last part and the most difficult part is about private data, and I, I, uh, I know that uh, there are different uh, solutions, and may maybe Tabitha will talk about that data trust. I know in, in Germany there have been industrial data space as well, and 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 we have not been able to crack the nuts uh, in France at this stage for every I mean for every every sector like just one 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 size fits all uh, solution. What we see is uh, legal fears and, and, and a lot of questions from, com from companies. And we see be perhaps we have emphasized too much on sharing data or, or data flows, which are, which are awful things that companies are not comfortable with. And maybe the question right now and on which we will focus on, on the next months is about access to data. Uh, how It's not about me sharing my data. It's about me as a startup, what kind of data I can access to? And I, I can access to health, through health that I have. Maybe I want to access to other companies, but put it, put it that way, maybe it's, it's more connected to the actual business of, of the companies. Yeah, that's actually a, really a question that I would like to sort of pass on to Tabitha. I mean, uh, clearly you're coming from a country where probably the national AI strategy is not the number one uh, priority uh, of policy makers at the moment. But, um, and we'll talk about that in a second. But oh, yeah. um, <laughs> before that, um, what um, Bertrand um, mentioned or, or sort of like what he um, kind of referred to is there's public data, making public data available, but then there's also this entire potential of private data. And companies somehow understandably fear that once they make their data available, you know, this will help their competitors and harm their own business. Um, you know, have you found a solution to that? Or like what, what, what are you offering companies in the UK to sort of like share their data? So I think... Um we, we've done it, we've, we've made a similar move where we st have started with things like the Open Data Institute that are helping with, uh, with public data. And then this, this shift towards the data trust concept whereby companies and individuals and organizations can come together and decide a set of rules by which they will then share data. Um, and it's been a real challenge. I've sat in workshops with Element AI that recently uh, launched their paper with Nesta that came out uh, on Friday. Um, and what, what's... The challenges is that the political tensions are s uh, and commercial tensions are so strong. So you have academics in the room, and you have um, you have engineers in the room, and you have editors in the room, and you have lawyers in the room. And having more than two lawyers in a room, really, I mean, it makes for, for such a difficult conversation. Um, <laughs> and so they are grappling with, with with how we're going to figure that out. But what was exciting is we have launched three pilots. So we've been able to launch a pilot around wildlife uh, and animals, one around um, uh, in Greenwich around clean air and, and, uh, and the local authority there, and one for uh, reducing food waste. And I'm most excited about the food waste um, 
because it links directly to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and so it's, it feels like the right place to start because there's a common desire for good, which I think really helps if we're going to crack you know, the chicken and the egg kind of nut. Um, once we've solved it for something where we know everybody wants to benefit, I think it will help, number one. But number two, it's also data that, um, that we hope isn't competitive advantage in the same way that you were concerned about. So it's uh, supermarkets and restaurants uh, sharing uh, sharing their data, and I think they can unlock something like 250 meals a year. So there's some, there's some good um, progress happening that's being led by the ODI, and um, we're trying our best. And when I say we, there's obviously, as you described, me as Cognition X, and then there's me as uh, the chair of the AI Council. We're trying our best to help the UK government with what they've already agreed, uh, um, and thinking then through like what's what's next. Um, and that that definitely is a little bit harder at the moment. <laughs> And we'll get to that, but first of all, Bjorn, I want to include you in the conversation. Um, the, the chapter that your ministry oversaw within the German AI strategy is looking at the effects of AI on work, on the labor market. Um, and one of the key questions you're raising in that chapter is, you know, how can Germany make sure its workforce is fit? for this disruption that's coming ahead. And the pitch you're making in there, if I can sort of like summarize it, is, you know, A, Germany will update and to a certain degree overhaul its, its life learning, uh, lifelong learning, uh, you know, uh, schemes and, and, and programs. But at the same time, you're also saying, you know, it's important to kick off such training schemes and th such programs now to be sort of ahead of the curve so that once sort of the, the, the major disruption happens, um, the country is prepared for that. Um, so, in order to do that, you know, what are th the kind of initiatives that you kicked off already to make sure you know, Germany is getting fit in that regard? Well, our focus on, on AI and um, digitalization um, is that um, our economy is based on a strong workforce, on a strong level, high skill and like workers who have a good vocational education um, uh, and who are really productive uh, in the economy. And um, now we have to um, uh, give the answer for two questions. The first question is, how do we bring these strong workforce to the next level? Which is really difficult. Because we are talking about people who are 45 years old, who had their times in school 20 years ago, um, who really do not know, is that, was that a good experience or not? And um, um, so uh, we need new measures to bring um, uh, our skilled workers to the digital level. And, and tell us about them. Yeah, tell I, us about I, tell the about measures, yeah. I, I just will mention the second question. And the second question is that we are not really good in Germany to bring our um, research findings to the shop level. To, so the transfer process is really important for us because we have a lot of smaller medium enterprises which are hidden champions in the whole world. And um, uh, now to, um, yeah, to um, re-innovate their production process is a really difficult point. And so we need to be faster in that process. And that also deals with the first question. And so how we do it, we, we introduced a qualification law uh, in the beginning of this year. And we, um, we give uh, financial investments to the further training measures via our, our employment insurance. And we also give um, people the chance to have these further trainings for four, five, six, maybe eight months um, to, um, uh, to come to another level um, and to get the skills that are needed in the future. I can give you one example where this uh, law is used to, um, yeah, to transform the whole company. Volkswagen, which is a small uh, media enterprise in Germany, um, is uh, um, um, uh, closed a factory in Zwickau, which was for produce the Trabant. Maybe you know that better. Um, and this um, um, is a um, um, factory of 5,000 employees there, and they closed that factory to transform the car that they built it there, uh, constructed there, to an electronic vehicle. And so they needed not mechatronics, is that the right term? I don't know, uh, we have the mechatronics in German, mm -hmm. and um, uh, to coders. So they need uh, Apple Volkswagen or something, yeah? And um, so um, they reskilled all these uh, 5,000 employees to a, a coding level and use our money for that. And this is a huge project within that 
qualification strategy that we have or that we introduce in the AI strategy in Germany. Okay. How long does it take? So, I'm sorry? How long does it take? Uh, it's in law, so it's... Uh, no, so, uh, to train the, them it's 5,000, because that's an amazing... Um, they, they, they closed the factory for, for 12 months, and um, they have um, further training measures for six months for every employee. That's so awesome. There could be some good news coming from Volkswagen at some yeah. point soon, which is, you know, <laughs> a change. Um, it's a nice story. <laughs> Tabitha, the elephant in the room. <laughs> um, I thought you said you were going to talk about this. We mentioned it before, or I said it, like, when I, when I asked my first question to um, um, right at the beginning. Um, it is another key factor for an AI industry is talent, is cutting edge experts in the field. And the UK is, and this is something that, you know, we have to say the UK is out of the three countries still leading in the field. The UK has, you know, by all measures, the sort of like most thriving AI industry. But now your country is going through political disruption. And um, one sort of like key factor for the UK to be as successful as it is was that it was always an attractive destination for immigration. For, for talent to come in. Um, can you give us sort of a glimpse into the AI scene in the UK at the moment? How do you perceive that? Is there like, like how, how, how are people feeling about Brexit? So I can't, I, I can't uh, draw <laughs> great um, swathes over how people are feeling, but I can tell you how I feel. Um, and I hope this doesn't sound naive to people in this room, but I feel like we are, we are potentially leaving uh, the EU, but we're definitely not leaving Europe. And the the job that I feel I have to do is make sure that we are spending as much time doing all of the all of the things that we have been doing. So we've, as as Wendy just said, we've just put another 150 million into skills. We've been looking at our visa programs, like all the things that we're already doing. But also, we need to collaborate more with Europe, not less, and certainly not imposed by the rules that the EU has or doesn't have. And I think um, that's why I'm here. Uh, that's why all, Wendy's here. That's why we're all trying to spend as much time thinking about how can we actually keep collaborating. Because um, as I know that we have to talk about tomorrow, which is how can Europe lead? Rather than can this be England versus France, I just don't, I don't, I don't personally see that being a, a conversation where anybody wins. Whereas if we can work together I think we will find ourselves in a much better position in uh, um, uh, in situations where we might actually feel antagonistically against the way that the U.S. are going to um, uh, are going to make a de the political decision or a, uh, or a kind of uh, moral decision. China, like I would much rather be in a situation where we're working together. So I think from a EPRS standpoint and the EU funding for academics, all of those things don't have to change. And it really is up to us in the UK and people like myself and a lot of Brits that I can see here and people who have decided that, that Britain is their home to make that really clear. Um, and a lot of it's a marketing problem. So there's a fear factor that actually, in many cases, that fear might never be, uh, that might never be uh, come to fruition. Or even worse, it's not even a fear that we need to worry about at all. Um, so, for example, uh, last Wednesday, the Chancellor just announced that any job that needs um, a PhD, any job, so this is not just AI, but any PhD job, they will have no cap. So there are things that we are trying to do, but does that actually get to the general everyday person? No. I think that's a real, that the, real, the real issue we have at the moment is, um, is fear and, and not knowing Mm -hmm. what's next. And that does make life, I'm getting goosebumps, it does make life harder. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as an entrepreneur, I think it, it, it equals opportunity. Yeah. Bertrand, your, your country is not leaving the EU. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> ah! Hopefully. <laughs> and, um, hopefully. <laughs> in your, <laughs> um, as, as far as I'm in I'm informed. And <laughs> um, in your strategy, it's, you know, this is something that's clear in the strategy. It's also something that's clear that your elected officials, including President Macron, President Macron, have made clear. You see, uh, European cooperation is key for the success in AI. Um, and one, uh, um, uh, you know, one idea that always pops up that Macron himself has mentioned is that, you know, this cooperation could also start where it often starts on a German-Franco level. Um, from what I hear, there's something in the making there. So can you tell us about, you know, wh how, you know, what, what, what are the kind of like German-Franco initiatives that could sort of like kick off European AI? 
Uh, I think, and I will speak under the control <laughs> of, uh, of Bjorn, uh, obviously it's, it was a priority for France to work with, with Germany and we, we had a, uh, a member of the of German government that, w that was present where, um, when we presented our strategy and, and also Cédric Villani was there also when the, at the IT Gipfel uh, last, uh, in the last December. And we... It's the digital summit now. IT yeah, Gipfel was uh, yeah, two okay, years ago, two they don't <laughs> say it. <laughs> yeah, IT okay, okay, sorry, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm already... Okay. So, um, so I think we have two levels of, of, uh, of discussion. One is about research. So we, we have selected four, four centers for research. Uh, Germany has, has uh, five, I guess, and, and will be expanded to other, t other type of centers. So we'll try to, to have a link on, a, on, a, on a, strong, a strong link between one of ours and one of, uh, one of the Germans' excellent center on research. And we have a lot to share, I think, on, on this uh, topic. And the other one is about industry. And there, uh, the, the idea was to, uh, from my point of view, <laughs> is to have a, a com complementary approach. I think the, the German industry is uh, way stronger than, than the French industry, but we have, a st we have in France uh, a strong, strong uh, skills in, in, in machine learning, in, in computer science, in, in perhaps startup developments, and we, we, sh we should seek to find a way to benefit from each other from perhaps the robotics industry that is also very strong in, in, the, in Germany and perhaps more the software, uh, the software uh, skills that we have in, in, uh, in France. We'll see how we, we will be able to, 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 match, uh, to match this, but uh, uh, this, is, yeah, this is something that we think is important, but uh, also mentioned that we want to, to work with other countries and I know for instance, we, we plan to work with uh, Finland and uh, obviously with the, the wool of Europe, but we... And the UK? And, and the UK, the, oh, obviously. Right? The we have the, the French UK uh, MOU has already been signed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Don't go of back course. on me yeah. now. That's <laughs> <laughs> we're good, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah we're good. Kay. Yeah, because no, sorry, I was screwed uh, it all up. Uh, yeah. Just one <laughs> okay. trip. Yeah. Okay. No, no, obviously, and obviously, and uh, for instance, with uh, regarding research, we have a lot yeah. of, uh, of of strengths to to build with the uh, Turing Institute and, and other other fields. Um, but we we now also expect uh, Europe to have perhaps a common strategy, and and it's because we we won't be able to have exactly the same objectives as Germany or UK. And, and, and we expect perhaps from, from the next commission to be able to, to transform its coordinated plan to a, an actual strategy where Europe can, can, can explain how, what are its strengths and how it, it will, what, what it will achieve in five years. And we'll discuss exactly that tomorrow. And I think Wendy Hall very much set the stage for that. Um, it's gonna be, there's going to be controversy. Um, Björn, last question. Are you, are you on board with what Bertrand suggested for the German Franco cooperation. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, <laughs> Don't let me For go. sure, for sure. <laughs> I may not tell you anything this against is it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm on board. I must say, uh, for us, the core idea of that initiative was that um, it, sounds, um, um, uh, it sounds interesting, but um, we are not the United States and we're not China. We have to find our own European pathway on artificial intelligence. And um, so I do not really understand why, on, why aren't we self-confident in Europe to create that pathway. Um, in Germany, you have an um, um, interesting debate. On one side, we are losing um, the competition against China and the US. The other said we are the best researchers and the best companies and so on and so on. And there's nothing between. <laughs> but I think uh, if we um, come back to the European pride, uh, then we can create uh, on the regulatory level, we can create on the um, um, uh, research framework, we can create uh, international foreign policy NNA, which is really important. I could see it in the US last week, um, I was there in Berkeley and in the southwest of West in Austin, um, they look to Europe, they look to the GDPR, okay. 
They look to our uh, legal framework that we have and that we're introducing uh, in, uh, in the European Union. And so I think we can self confident enough to find a way uh, which uh, deals with um, research investments, which, which deals with um, um, seed and growth funding, which also deals with a regulatory framework which helps our societies and uh, to to have trust in the technology yeah. and to help our companies um, to lead uh, the technology process. Yeah. And you know, Wendy Hall, who's probably on the Eurostar by now, but she would probably say, yeah, but we still have to be able to build yeah. AI systems in Europe too. Sure. So that, that has to be the end goal. Yeah. Thank you three very much. I think you know, we're, we're, getting, we're getting a really good um, idea for um, uh, sort of the, how complex and heated um, the debate might be tomorrow. But I think um, it's also what's also becoming clear is that um, all across Europe, there's lots of people thinking about how to uh, um, sort of do the next steps and, and make sure Europe is becoming a world leader in AI as well. And um, without further ado, I'd uh, like to open the floor uh, for the main <laughs> course. <Okay. laughs> I don't think that's just <laughs> <laughs> I know, me too. <laughs> um. <laughs>